Asian Commission on Human Security, Commissions on the Social Dimensions of Globalization, and the International Advisory Board of the International Crisis Groups. As an extraordinary political leader and member of several international forums, he has championed for the values of democracy and human, human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Surin Pisuan, please. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Your Excellency Nazira, the Ambassador of Malaysia to Thailand, Dr. Nashruddin of GMM, Dr. Vinay Dahlan, Dr. Jaran, members of the organizing committee distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I accept this invitation with a sense of humility because the issue that you ask me to talk about is an extremely complicated issue. That's why I came with all these books, <laughs> so that if I need some references, at least I can open up and show you. That's a scholar in me. I have been in the profession of diplomacy for the last 40 plus years, but deep down, I'm still a student who is always in search of more knowledge, more understanding, and more guidance. And when I say that, it is not very much far away from the issue that we are addressing today. I think the problem of extremism, the challenge of fundamentalism, and the derivatives of these two have something to do with the lack of what the philosophers would call the philosophical humility. Meaning, I know that I know very little. Meaning, well, in the tradition of Islam anyway, the wisdom from the pondok, from the madrasa, from the schools here in southern Thailand, southern Philippines, Malaysia, northern, the wisdom of the madrasa is at the end of your reading the text, the Quran or otherwise, with your students. The professors, the gurus, invariably invoke this phrase, Wallahu A'lam. And I can show you at the end of this book, Ibn Khaldun, the philosopher of history, 15th century, supposed to be the founder of many modern sciences, including history, including sociology, including anthropology, economics, eth ethnic studies. Ibn Khaldun, originally Yemen, but moved to Egypt, moved to North Africa, at the end of this book, Introduction to History, Human History, he said, God knows best. 
That's the tradition. The realization and the awareness and the passionate exception that I know very little, therefore I should hold back from making a judgment on other people. And the problems of fundamentalism, problem of the extremism have grown from this lack of accepting the fact that I know very little. So for moderation to take root, you need a philosophical understanding of the scholarship that you are pursuing or the scholarship that underpins, that informs your intellectual exercises. You need that philosophical understanding that the realm of knowledge is forever open. And human beings are creatures of him who are provided with hikmah, the faculty of reason, rationality, that we can use our mind to understand the natural phenomena. And the Quran and the hadith and the tradition of Islamic, classical Islamic studies are full of this recognition that human beings are animals with the ability to reason. Insanun nadiq. So when I say moderation can only take place when you have that philosophical outlook, mindset, that I'm not going to be absolute about this issue. I leave some part of it for my fallibility. He knows. He knows more than I. So what I'm telling my students, or what I'm writing, or what I'm communicating, or what I'm pronouncing, what I am judging, Maybe only 75% right, maybe only 50% right, maybe 50% wrong, maybe 75% wrong, maybe I am right, only 25%. So, Dato, how do you propel the global movement of moderates if we don't go to the fundamental assumption? of the message. Moderation means I restrain myself from calling you a kafir, from saying that what you're doing is haram, from saying that my opinion is the only one that is right, that is correct. The rest are nonsense. That's absolutism. That's dogmatic. That's the narrowness of the mind rather than the openness of the intelligence. I went to Oxford for a year and never had British education. I was and I am proud of that association, affiliation with Oxford. I bought a pin, in fact, the, the, the cufflinks are still Oxford. I bought a pin and put it here, not this one. I walk into the Regent Mosque in London. And I was dragged by hand, take that pin out. I guess the assumption is God doesn't want to know, doesn't need to know that you are affiliated with Oxford. But I said, MashaAllah, I didn't think anything about this thing. I am here to pray. I just happened to be here at the Asar time. 
afternoon prayer. I just want to pray. That's had nothing to do with my being here trying to pray with you. But this scholar, wheelchair from the Sudan, in white, said, take it out. You are not supposed to wear anything in the front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if you are moderate, you are not going to call that kind of judgment. If you are moderate, you will be reluctant to tell anybody else, to correct anybody else, to impose on anybody else your opinion on that particular issue. That's why I think we first have to address that philosophical, that academic, that intellectual foundation of what is moderation, what is moderate. So, to me, you have to adopt a new mindset. A mindset that would allow human intelligence, if me Khaldun call it, habit of intellection. Meaning you use your reasoning ability to deduce, to draw conclusions, to compare, to draw analogy, and to come to the conclusion what is what, which is right, which is wrong, on your own, by your own, with your own ability. Of course within the frame, of course within the hadith, within the Quran, but your own exertion, ijtihad, has to be there. And you are responsible for it. Those who understand the Quran. Allah does not expect from anybody more than the ability of him or her. That soul. So it is the individual that is being called upon to stand up and do your own reasoning. Do your own analysis, do your own analogy. So get rid of that mentality of absolutism that our way is the only way. Everybody else is wrong. And nobody else understands the text, the hadith, and the heritage, the legacy that we have received 1,400 years ago. Nobody could make a judgment on that except me, us. That's the root of extremism. That's the root of ex absolutism. That's the root of conflicts among us and between us. Now here is a problem, and you have it in Malaysia, and they have it in Indonesia. It's called Arabization of Islam. Sultan of Yahoo, <laughs> Ibrahim Iskandar said, we have our own norms, we have our own values, we have our own culture, we have our own habits. What's wrong with our brand of Islam? It's our experiences collected, accumulated through years, 600 years of Islam here in the peninsula. And now everything had to be thrown away. And you have to accept absolutist view of the interpretation of the religion. Sultan Ibrahim Iskandar said, that's not right. Be careful about that. Indonesia, Nahdudul Ulama came up with a video clip. Divine grace of East Indies Islam. Again, 600 years of cultivation, 600 years of accommodation, 
600 years of dialogue between and among cultures. 17,000 islands of Indonesia, 400 languages. A lot of serious dialogue, exchange, accommodation, refutation, acceptance, the process of civilizational accommodation, not the clash of civilization. And the Nahdatul Ulama, 100 years old, and U, came up with this divine grace from East Indies Islam. MashaAllah. And asking the people of Indonesia, the largest Muslim in the world, country in the world, to pay more attention to your own heritage, your own product of your own reasoning, of your own experiences accumulated through the years. Lot third, what is it? Third largest democracy in the world. And they have done a survey. With the ISIS and with Daesh, how many of you oppose that? 79% of those surveyed in Indonesia said no. They did the same in Pakistan, 26% said no. Meaning 74% said so-so. I mean, we can go along with the ideology absolutist. Absolute dogmatic, fundamentalist, exacting, no flexibility. 26% in Pakistan said they were wrong. 74% might say we can live with that. So the issue now is this the issue now is how much space is allowed for human intelligence? When Ibn Khaldun, when Hussein Nasr said the height, the height of Islamic civilization was when, I have to make sure that I'm, you're not taking me wrong, that I'm not saying this, it's Hussein Nasr and Khaldun himself. Ibn Khaldun. The height of science and technology and innovation in the Islamic community, the larger Islamic world, the height of it was achieved when non Arabs work on those science, technology, and innovation. Hussein Nast said, wherever Islam went, Civilization, art, science, technology had gone to the height of it. Persia, India, Turkey, Spain. Why did he use that sent that tense? Where Islam went. Fi'il Madi, those who know Arabic. Why did he use has gone to? Why did Hussein Nas did not use where Islam is. Why does it have to be the past? Well, I think Ibn Khuldun answered that. At the height of mathematics, the height of medicine, the height of philosophy, according to Ibn Khuldun, even Arabic grammar, even Arabic grammar, was done by Sibawai, a Persian 
scholar. Because two or three hundred years after the text, after Revelation, after Muhammad, the Persians, the Indians, the North Africans were asking, how are we going to get to the soul of the text if we don't know the grammar, if we don't know the language in which it was revealed? So Sibawai came up with the rule of the grammar of the Arabic language, a Persian. I submit to you that 1.5 billion people should continue that right to seek and search for the answers that the Ummah, the Muslim, are facing now in our interaction with the rest of the human family. Six billion more. Because if you abdicate, if you reject that responsibility to bring from the text, from the book, from the tradition, and close your minds, the gate of istihaj is closed. From now on, you follow. Don't use your mind. People like Tariq Ramadan would certainly disagree with that. He said, Muslims in Europe must find their home in Europe. Try to make sense of the environment, sociological, political, economic, cultural of Europe. You can't live in Europe wishing that the environment would be the same as in North Africa. Make sense of your own existence in the context of Europe. That would require what Imi Khaldun called the habit of intellection. The research that you want to do with the scholars of peace, Dato, and thank you the ambassador for supporting this effort, Each and every one of us as a community will have to find a way how to handle this environment which is pluralistic, which is a characteristic of globalization, which is the reality of modern world. One point two billion of us, I'm not talking of Muslim, but one point two billion out of seven point four are tourists around the globe. And among them a lot of Muslims. About hundred million are ref uh, migrants. About thirty are refugees. Most of the refugees are Muslims running away from their homeland. We have to answer that question. Why are we making that migration, facing dangers and perils across the sea, but we still would want to do it? Because somehow, back home, there's no protection, there's no security, there is no confidence. So you move, we move. And, and whom do we meet? People who are different. Diversity, which is part of humanity. 
But we have to make sense of that diversity. ต้องเข้าใจความแตกต่างหลากหลายนั้น It is not enough to say that yes, all humanity is created from one pair, Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve. Therefore, we are brothers. It's that's the message. But do we get to the soul of that message? Do we really live that message? Do we really bring it about and? Make it a part of our daily life. I respect you. You respect me. Together, we reconcile and we want peace and harmony in our community, in our country, in our society. I think the responsibility is on all of us. And I understand this morning the vice chancellor, vice rector of the university, brought this up. That this problem is not limited to the Muslim community. This problem is happening in the entire region. This hate speech, this we and you, this me and you, this separation, this isolationist kind of attitude. It's not only now; it is spreading. And that is going to be a challenge for all of us in this Southeast Asia Big Sea community called ASEAN. Tremendous diversity here. Only opening up to each other, respecting each other, mutual respect for each other, collaboration with each other, trying to understand each other. And to begin to do that, you can't hold that mindset that absolute. Can't touch. Sultan Yahoo said, "If I want to shake hand with a woman, it's up to me. Don't tell me it's haram. Yeah, a woman. Yeah. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I mean, these kind of things that somehow." Characterize the accommodative, the moderate, the the. I think the word flexibility can can bring me problem, but I mean these are the kind of things that we accommodate each other through the ages, and we have to live with it. Let me drop another bomb. When you are used to absolutism in your political, economic, and social governance, when you only know absolute power, when government and state provides. Everything you don't have to ask. We know what you want. When we have enough, we've been provided enough. We'll take care of you. You don't have to struggle. All of a sudden, they have to face the openness. And it's very difficult to understand that diversity out there. It's not the same as what we used to. So there's a sense of alienation. There's a sense of not quite belonging, not quite secure, not quite comfortable until you are made the same as us. Until you believe the same, until you practice the same, until you adopt our interpretation. I once, as foreign minister of this country, went to visit Iran. And the protocol is the, vis the visiting foreign minister shall have a courtesy call on 
the head of state, the president. The head of state at that time happened to be Muhammad Khatami. The one who suggested to the UN that we should have dialogue among civilizations before 9-11, one year before. And I know he studied philosophy in Iran before he left the country. He went to Germany. He studied philosophy there. He got his PhD, I think, from Hamburg. And I asked him this question, Dato. In the assembly of his cabinet, my delegation, in his office, I asked him this question, not about oil, not about investment, and not about tourism. But I asked him, Excellency, suppose there are two Muslims. One lives in a closed, controlled, and very, very narrow space for him or her to be a good Muslim. He is good. He prays every, five, every day five times. He do his uh, uh, fasting. <laughs> he practice all the rituals. But he lives in that closed society with absolute control. He's a good Muslim. Good. There's another Muslim who lives in an open space full of diversity. A lot of choices. Nobody control him. Nobody impose on him. Nobody force him to do anything. But he practice all the rituals required of him as a good Muslim. I ask him, Your Excellency, which one is a better Muslim? Khatami knew right away that that was an adaptation of Aristotle's idea. When Aristotle talked about good citizen and good man, Aristotle said good citizen, it depends on the regime. If you are in a tyranny, you have to submit. And then you are good. If you are in a democracy, you have to participate. And then you are good. You can't submit. If you are in an authoritarian regime, you have to respect the power of the authority. You have no choice. So, good citizen depends on the nature of the regime. Aristotelian. Good man, Aristotle said, is good universally. Whichever regime he lives under, whichever cultural environment, he finds himself ill in, he remains a good person. Well, Khatami listened to me and was silent for a while and then clapped his hand on his knee and laughed and laughed and said, you Muslims in Southeast Asia are better than many of us around here. So he admitted. That's what I mean when you are used to that controlled environment, absolute, all of a sudden you have to face globalization. All of a sudden you have to face these forces of globalization. What do you do? You are at a loss. And that's exactly what is happening. To me, extremism or terrorism is a maladjustment to the environment that they have found themselves in. They can't adjust to this open space. Nobody instruct, nobody give them order, nobody point direction. They have to decide for themselves to be good or to be bad. All of a sudden, this is not the environment that we want, therefore, either seek to change it, and if you can't change, 
Use every means that you can to the point of sacrificing in order to confront that alien environment. But again, quoted in Ibn Khaldun, the prophet, prophet said, you try to change things that are wrong. If you can't, you speak out against things that are wrong. If you can't do that, you try to live yourself according to your own conscience. Never force was not the first order of things. There's hadith on that. So to me, extremism and terrorism are symptoms of maladjustment to the changing global environment. Because you have to adjust, to accommodate, to live with the differences. Because you are no longer absolute within your own. I went to Harvard with the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship. When I became minister, a vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation came to me over dinner, asking advice. We have helped produce the Green Revolution the strain of rice that would produce a lot of rice called the Green Revolution. We want something as big, the Rockefeller Foundation. Can you give us some idea? And then he came up with his own idea. How about being independent from Middle Eastern oil? Over dinner. I said, can you imagine and think of the consequence of that idea? That all these years, you were patronizing them, importing their energy, paying them, so that they could establish the welfare state that they have. And you said you're going to withdraw. You said you will be independent. And they are now independent. Not because of the Rockefeller policy, but because of the technology that could get gas out of shale. So oil price drop. Economy nose dive. Problems, problems, problems. Malaysia is a different story because not only digging the resources in the earth but also digging into the minds of the people. Science, technology and innovation. So the way you adjust to the oil price dive, drive, uh, dive you are holding. Many of those countries are now having to find a way to manage. Because America now is exporting energy. Well, Trump or Trump, that's another matter, <laughs> another, another lecture. <laughs> but, but that's the problem. When you are used to everything being blessed to you, You don't worry about anything else. You stop thinking. And you want everything to be as you are accustomed to. I, I think people who follow the problems in the Ummah understand I don't know how to make people, friends from outside the community to understand. Um, only to say that Wahhabism <laughs> <laughs> is the brand of Islam 
that is extremely absolutist and dogmatic. Arabization is Wahhabization. Most of us in Southeast Asia is Shafiites. And we can accommodate. And that's how we have accommodated in the past. Now that process of Arabization is creating tension and confrontation and conflicts to the point where Nahdatul Ulama in Indonesia came up with that video clip divine blessings from East Indies Islam. Meaning this is a divine blessing too, not only you. So when you are used to that kind of environment, it is very difficult to adjust to the wider world where things are different. Human affairs are always in the state of flux, Machiavelli said. Always moving. Always waving. You can't control it. And then you have to adjust with those changes. Calm. Maladjustment is the consequence. Or terrorism, or fundamentalism, or extremism are symptoms of maladjustment. And maladjustment is a symptom of this being used to pro be protected in an environment that you feel secure. When I speak to my students in the South, I use this in order to tell them that you have to change because things change around you. In Surah al Jumah, after the prayer on Friday, you spread on the surface of the earth in search of Fadlullah, blessings from God. فَإِذَا قُضِيَةِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Those who know the Qur'an. When you finish the prayer, spread out and look for rizqi or fadlullah. Well, Minerals are depleted. <laughs> Even fresh water is depleted. Now Fadlullah is in the Gulf of Thailand. Two kilometers down and ten kilometers horizontal pipe to get gas and oil out for this country and for Malaysia. We have the joint development area. 7,000 square kilometers in the Gulf, lower Gulf of Thailand. Well, fantashiru fil ardu wa min fadlillah. Spread on the land of God in order to benefit from his blessings and his fadlullah. Well, if you don't have that science, if you don't have that technology, if you don't have that innovation, what do you do? Somebody else will do it for you. It is not as when your grand uh, I, when I talk to my student, not when your grandfather was tilling the soil, growing rice, or tapping rubber. That was enough. This is a new world. How do you adjust to the changes? Only by the development of your skills and your expertise and your knowledge. And that can only come with the habit of intellection. Use your intelligence. Use your reasoning. Use your ability in the reasoning, faculty of reason, logic. So I guess a message for you to take home is that in the past, one by an Arab 
who lives in the UK, professor of physics, wrote the House of Wisdom last year. One by a Westerner, Jonathan Lyons, same title, The House of Wisdom. And in here, it's Al Biruni, the stars, the astrologer. In here, the philosophers. In here, the medical expertise like Ibn Sina. In here, all those great giants when Islam was the glory. What I'm saying is they have used intellection, they have used reasoning, they have used their intelligence. And Ibn Rush, I mean, uh, Ibn Khaldun said, a lot of them are non-Arabs. <laughs> they're Indians, they're Persians, they're Berbers, they're Spaniards, they're Turks. They are tribes. The only way we can reclaim that lost glory is to come back and concentrate on the development of the mind. And in order to come back to that point of development of the mind, you have to get rid of that absolutist mindset. You have to get rid of I know best. You have to get rid of that I have the only interpretation that is correct. The rest are wrong. And you have to go back to my madrasa at the grassroots when the guru said, Wallahu alam, he knows better. He knows best. This is the message that I want you to go home with. We have to be more humble about our own knowledge that we think we have. And then we allow others to come in, and then we exchange, and then we discuss, and then we learn from each other. Then we will come to this, whatever you want to call it, moderation, awasatiya. Khayru ummatan. Ummatan awasata litakunu shuhada a'alan nas. All these phrases and names can only be put into practice if we begin with the assumption that I know quite little and I need to know more and others will have to help me and I will have to work with others so that together we can build another renaissance which is going to be informed by that sense of humility and moderation that the great scholars of the past have used as their inspiration and their guidance in order to create, in order to create that great civilization in diversity. And the challenge for all of us in ASEAN is how to manage that diversity, how to live with that diversity. Half of ASEAN is Muslim, over half speaking Malay. And that half will have to find a way forward. And I would say a way forward is nothing alien it's nothing strange, nothing foreign. They have done it before. And it could be done again. Only if we bring ourselves down and work with others, respect others, mutually respecting each other, then we'll find the way forward. Thank you for the opportunity to open my heart to you. 
I come here with all these things. If you want to know more, please come and borrow. I'll let you read this text. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan, Dr. Surin Piswan, the former of ASEAN Secretaries. I'm very appreciated for your crossing keynote and wonderful and fruitful knowledge of you here. And now, once again, uh, I would like to invite our ambassador, Dato Nasira binti Hussein in the front to presenting our special books from Muslim Studies Center, Jalalongkorn University to Dr. Surin Pisuan, please. Jazakallah khairan Dato' Nasira and Dr. Surin Pitsuwan. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now entering to the closing of the today conference on the titans of moderation and Islamic approach to face the global transition on ASEAN Thailand.